It's time for the Wrestling Perspective Podcast. I'm Dennis Farrell. That guy sitting next to me is Lars Fredrickson, podcaster extraordinaire, and sometimes a musician. What's up, bud? Oh, you know, running around like a chicken with my head cut off. But we got homicide today, so I'm pretty stoked. I, I, I was just telling him before you got here, uh, I met him during the uh, OGs and um, LAX feud that led in the Slammiversary. What was it, 2018, 2019, something like that? And and how PD introduced me to him, and uh, he said hi, shook my hand, and went off to do his match, and then he came back and sat down with me, and actually apologized to me for like being rude. I'm like, dude, you're not, you got to go wrestle. What are you talking about? And he he was one of the few talent. All those all those guys were busy doing work. I'm not burying anybody, but he was one of the few talents that that every time I saw him during that run that an impact would come up and say hi to me. And uh, for and I told him for that, he will always be one of my favorite wrestlers. Lars, you are I mean, when I told you that uh, the NWA helped us book him, you you flipped your lid. Well, you know, <laughs> when a guy with the name of homicide is nice to you, you got to take that. You got to take you got to take that as a W. You know what I mean? So, well, yeah, no, super stoked, Dennis. I'm super stoked. Welcome, homicide. Thank you for coming on, buddy. Uh, thank you for having me, man. Thank you so much. Very humble, man. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, you, you said humble a few times now, even before we recorded, and that kind of leads into several of my questions. And you've always had success in professional wrestling, but it seems like over the last two years, the fans have truly come to appreciate who you are and what you've done. I, I've looked back and I've I've followed your career for many, many, many years now. And it seems like you never quite got that just do with the fans until recently. Even what was it, AEW in New York? That pop might have been what one of the set two, three biggest pops in AEW history right now. I, I mean, did did you see this resurgence kind of late in your career coming? Oh, hell no, man. I'm just I'm just happy to be here, man. Like it was like a wake up call, man. I turned 45 years old and I'm still here. I was gambanging. I was doing a lot of stupid stuff. I got two kids. You know, I'm not saying I'm goody goody. You know, I'm still the same guy. I'm still an outlaw, but uh, I'm just happy to be here, man. And just having the vision and seeing people that I really like and being part of positive people, you know, the, not these knuckleheads back in the days that, you know, they try to uh, snake you, but. In Queens, man, oh, man, it, it, it did not hit me because I was coming to visit the boys. And one day, John Moxley said, you doing something today. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm just chilling. I'm just, I'm, I am wanted to hang out with the friends. And him and Eddie Kingston, Tony Khan, they surrounded me. And basically, Tony Khan said, well, come to my office. I want you to do something. And his digits, and I'm like, okay, I might do something tonight. And uh, I went out there, I, I heard no pop, man. It really, really hit me afterwards when um they played Fex Sinatra, New York, New York. And that's when it hit me. And I'm like, wow, I can't believe I'm here. And the support of the people, the fans was giving me. Because back in the days, man, I had a rough, rough, rough road, you know. um. Of course, God rest his soul. New Jack, everybody's calling me. I'm a wannabe New Jack. I feel I'm not a wannabe at all. I'm myself, you know what I mean? And some fans was calling me that, and it was kind of like, it was hurting me, you know what I mean? Because I hate that word, wannabe. I hate that. So I did it myself. I'm going to be a, a strong side wrestler. Mind you, I really don't like brawling. The hardcore, but I that helped me pay the bills and I do it so well. So I said, screw it. But I love catch wrestling. I love that Japanese style wrestling, you know. So I said, let me try that with Ring of Honor. And, and somehow they got me doing brawling. And like I said, I could do that so good. And I did it and I took off and I blew up. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that is impressive about your career is how many different styles that you have sort of taken on, so to speak. You can get in the ring and kind of be, you know, hold your own with anybody, whether it be death matches or like the strong style stuff or just your traditional wrestling. Well, my question actually sort of 
Does that, did that physicality as a youth growing up, do you feel like that helped you in any way, shape or form in professional wrestling to learn kind of dis- different styles, just being physical? Absolutely. Like, I always remember back in 1995 in New York City, I was watching uh, some kind of a, a promotion. It's called Extreme Temperature Wrestling. The first person I seen was Sabu. Wow. And I'm like, who the hell is this guy? I love this guy. You know, he, he was doing some crazy stuff. That's why, I, if you notice, I do my little topic, Kilo, my dive. Every dead devil moves, that's all Sabu. That's the big tribute, a shout out to Sabu. He doesn't know, but that boy, he inspired me that the way homicide is when it comes to like the hardcore, the death, is because of Sabu. And it, yes, it told my body for many years, but it worked. It worked. And like, I think Sabu, like, man, he did a lot so much for the rest of the business. He did so much for me. And um, yeah, man, my body is is aching, but it works, and I'm still here. <laughs> you, you are uh, the last I checked, a producer for the NWA, which one of their favorite producers, P.D. Williams, who we've always picked his brain. The insight he get, gave was just amazing. But from being a wrestler to being a producer, not every wrestler can make that leap. Who taught you how to be a producer and where did you kind of get your values of how you, in your mind, want to construct matches? Oh, I mean, I'm an undercover smart guy when it comes to pro wrestling. I know my knowledge. I know everything. I speak to legends. I speak to guys right now on TV. I get some of their knowledge and um, I use it on TV. And I always remember that um, back in the days, um, I mean, a couple of years ago, I was wrestling. Um, oh man, I forgot the name. I'm so sorry. But it was me and Eddie Kingston. It was pretty bad, and um, I went off. I went off with these two guys, and um, Ricky Morton was right behind me, and he told me that's the way you do it. And I didn't get it, but I marked out because Ricky Morton. So I was like, okay, cool, you know. But um, they told me we need a leader, a leader like that in our locker room. I think we're gonna get you a job. But we want you to be a producer than a wrestler. I felt some kind of way. I spoke to people like Er Hefner, his son, a couple of guys like, I'm telling you, man, this is the right move. Go for it. They show me a little bit of knowledge, a little book, telling me this is how you do it when it comes to timing, your vision. That, that, that's why it matters is your own vision. You know, and I got a crazy vision. It's good too. And then at first I didn't like it, but now I love it, man. I truly, truly love being behind the scenes right now as a producer, especially seeing my name at the credits. You know, like it's kind of cool, man. And especially where I'm from, I can't believe, <laughs> I can't believe at all. You know, like I'm very surprised that I'm still here. I'm surprised that I'm an agent producer for the NWA, especially the NWA because I mean, I, that was my second goal of life to become my NWA wrestler. Now I'm more behind the scenes of the NWA. So it's kind of cool, man. It's a blessing. Great team. Great team. Well, you know, one of the, uh, I just recently saw you on our West Coast uh, Pro show out here in San Francisco, where I'm from, and you still bring it. You still got it. So are you still doing a lot more of the indie wrestling or are you kind of wanting to wind that down and just get back and just stick with the producer role? Um, I'm, I, I'm actually doing 50, 50. I'm doing a lot of wrestling, man. I took, I'm taking two weeks off to heal my body, go back to the road and now I'm getting ready for producing and do a couple of independent shows. But yeah, I've been doing 50, 50, like, like right now, of course, I'm watching the Yankee game because I'm a big, a big baseball fan. But also, I've been studying. I've been watching like a lot of clips of the old school wrestling and put it the new era and just mix it up in a blender and put it in a book and maybe like call a couple of boys. Okay, this is what we should do. I'm telling it's gonna work, you know. And so yeah, man, I've been doing my homework, man, when I got my days off, but I've been so busy, man. So finally I got two weeks off. I'm going back in the road. I'm doing this independent show on Friday, June 10. Now I'm going back to NWA to become a producer and hopefully um defend my title. 
June 13th, 14th, and 15th, I believe, in Nashville. You can get your tickets at NWA Ticks, T-I-X.com. Just quick plug there for the NWA. Uh, and as a fan of the greatest franchise in baseball history, the Boston Red Sox, me, uh, I got to ask you about <laughs> – See how I slipped that in. Well, listen, Lars, you're always talking trash. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How many how many rings do the Sox have and how many rings do the A's have? Think about it, bro. Oh, good. That's good. That's a good one. So, you know, maybe you should fucking apologize for Babe Ruth. And uh (laughs) well, how many years? How many how many years they take you to break a curse? 120? Some fucking ten decades, yeah. There are more anyway. people on this podcast than there is for an Oakland A's home game. Just throwing that out there. Too. <laughs> That's because, our, you know what, Fisher fucking out. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Um, as, 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 like you said, as you're trans, transitioning in, into a producer role, do you find your style in the ring changing a little bit more as like, hey, look, I'm going to play it a little bit more safe because I, I do have this safety net behind me? I do. I, I started to notice that a couple of days ago. Like, I started noticing that, like, I wrestled Minu Suzuki in September of last year at GCW. Mm. And for some reason, that boy could hit. He could hit. And <laughs> every time he was hitting me, I was learning. Like, it was crazy. But he told me that, I'm just like, all they got to do is let them come to you. I'm always in the middle of the ring. Let them come to me. And you finish them. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do that. And of course, sometimes I got my dies. It's one of those. Screw it. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go for it. You know, and it's a fucking moment. That's what that is. You know, and but yeah, man. A couple of days, I just noticed that I changed my style just a little bit because of behind the scenes thing. You know, and also guys who cannot work. I always tell people. I don't need no scrubs when I wrestle them. You know, I don't need no has been or anything. Give me some good people. So so far so good. Well, you know, wrestling is obviously bigger now, probably than it's been in I don't know, ten years, fifteen years at least. Mm-hmm. And you know, because you have so many ways that you can actually digest, you know, the product, and there's so many promotions out there. Um, are you still watching professional wrestling on a regular basis? Are you, or are, has that kind of days gone by? Or if you are watching the shows, wh- you know what? What are you s- sort of staying on top of? Oh, absolutely. I've been watching. I don't watch um, not just this um, Monday Night Raw, SmackDown. I watch people that I know, like MVP is a good friend of mine, so I watch his stuff. Oh, when it comes to WWE. Only wrestling, I got a lot of friends only wrestling, but I like to watch this stuff because it's new, it's new product, it's different, you know. I watch independent shows, I watch like basically even bad independent shows, like it could be pure wrestling, death style wrestling, I watch them all. Um, I watch NWA as a fan and also as a producer. I watch the old, a lot of old school stuff for old Japan for wrestling, new Japan wrestling, NWA, ECW, WWF. So yeah, man, I watch, I watch everything, man. I like to pick their, their brains and, you know, put their little, little, little things in my blender and I talk to the boys and let them know this is what we should do. But yeah, man, I watch everything except I don't want to say, like, in the bad terms, you know, WWE, like, everybody said they're horrible, they're bad. You know, I'm not saying that, <laughs> but sometimes you want to see something new, you know, especially yeah. when it comes to independent, man, because that's the future. I will say this, man, independence is the future. You know, I like, somebody told me about Kevin um, Kevin Owens, you know, he, he can find independence. Look at him now, he's in the WWF ring. You're making millions of dollars, but look where he's from. So you got to support indie wrestling, man. But that's the future. Do you realize how much of a national treasure in wrestling you are? Because and before you answer this, I'm going to qualify this with a statement I've heard you say many, 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 many times is 
you, you, you're excited to see your friends, even though you're not there sometimes wrestle in front of 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 fans and how you always, you know, whether it's them or someone else, you support them. And, you know, one day you'll get your break here. You are, you get your break. We talked about the fans pop, but man, it just seems like everybody loves you and you're so down to earth and you just don't quite grasp that. Yeah, man, I just, I just don't give a shit. <laughs> like, I'm being real, you know, like, there's some people, I don't like yes, man, yes, man, I don't like those kind of people. Um, I don't know, I don't know what's the right term, the right grammar, I just don't give a shit. Like, like oh. been, you gotta you care know? that the fans love you. You you have to care that the fans love you, right? Oh, hell yeah, hell yeah, okay. they don't want me homicide. You know, I love them, man, I mean, but my fans, there was no homicide, you know? So, of course, man, I got to get big ups to the fans, but some of them is kind of local, like a cabeza. They're kind of crazy, you know what <laughs> I mean? So they got to chill out, you know what I'm saying? But that, bless them, man. I love my fans. I love even the haters. I love the haters because they're the one who motivates me even more, you know? Like, the ones who tells me, you cannot, you can't do this. Say, All right, watch me now. And I did it. You know, like certain people was telling me, you're never going to win the NWA Junior title. It's going to be Kobe Carino's belt. All right. And I beat him. So I got it in my home right now. And I defend it everywhere. I'll be calling myself the Hood Holly Race. Because I <laughs> so, so. I love, I love I, You know what? It's not too late for a name change, bro. <laughs> you know what I mean? The fucking Hood Harley Race. I love that. You know, <laughs> that's a t-shirt. <laughs> it is a t-shirt. I mean, um, you know, out of all the time that you've spent on the road, different promotions, is there an era for you that like you look back as the most fun, uh, 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 excuse me, that you look back most fondly on? So, cause I, I know, you know, you've had a lot of different uh, car rides with a lot of different wrestlers. And is there any that stick out in your mind or is there an era of, of, of your life, you know, where it was like, you know, you look back the most on, uh, let you look back on most fondly? Oh man, like the, I think the first time I ever wrestled, my first week, you know, busting my ass and going through paying dues, you know, my first car ride, you know, I still remember that um, my first ever national trip uh, going to Japan and Puerto Rico and Mexico, my everything. My first, I always think about that back of my head. Like I don't got uh, an order. Everybody tell me what is the biggest uh, moment in your life. Everybody said me and Dana Bryan when I beat him at Ring of Honor and, and New York City because it was my hometown. But I got crazy, crazy moments that is always in back of my head. Um, a day when I wrestled, when I helped out Moxley and Eddie Kingston in Queens for all in wrestling. That was a moment for me. Um, when I wrestled Min Minu Suzuki, that was a moment for me because I was saying as a joke, like, I think I was the first said to Rick Rude that he was at WWE TV and WCW at the same time because Rampage was on Friday and I was on TV and about uh, 20 minutes later, I'm in the independent show in Queens, New York, and it, it just showed twice a day. So, crazy moments, man. It's it's a lot. It's a lot, man. But the one thing I always remember is the first week when I ever wrestled, paid my dues, my first, my first cuts, uh, bruises, you know, uh, even guys that I didn't even like in this business, the, the, I call them dickheads, you know, so, man, so many memories. Well, talking about uh, your past, when you were like a wee little homicide before you became the homicide <laughs> now, you were a mix between Sting and The Undertaker. Uh, yeah. A lot of people don't know about that gimmick about you. Can you talk a little bit about making that jump from the Sting uh, Undertaker gimmick to the early stages of the homicide we see here today? Yeah, so back then, I started March 5th in 1994, and I was hanging out with a bunch of friends telling me, you need to do this gimmick. We do like a Puerto Rican assassins. I said, okay. 
So the face paint, Puerto Rican flag, and I'm into like, you know, the dark, you know, style. So I love Donna Taker. So I say, okay, I'm call myself the Land Tower. And I'm gonna wrestle like the Undertaker, but my face paint looked like Sting. And it was horrible. Like <laughs> one of those horrible moments of my life. So one day, um, matter of fact, it was the year after that, I was hanging out in Brooklyn with my boys and uh, man, I was telling them, yo, I can't stand this gimmick. I hate it. You know, but to me, like, I'm like a bullet sting and Undertaker. It's so corny. You know, I need to do something. You told me, be yourself. I, I didn't get that. What you mean, be myself? I said, be yourself. The way you on the streets, you know, because they call me demon. Like, D, you know? So I'm like, all right, be myself. But what you mean, be myself? So we was watching um, ECW. Plug an enemy. I didn't even know what these guys was. And I was saying to myself, they're from the hood? Oh, they're horrible. You know, I could do better. I said, all right, be yourself. Okay, so what's going to be my name? You know, MC Hammer, Vanilla Ice or something. <laughs> and some guy <laughs> on cops uh, on the run for homicide. He said, hop a homicide. And I'm like, that is the most stupidest thing ever. <laughs> all right, whatever. So... I became homicide, and I was in that channel at five, and I'm still homicide. That I'm still trying to change my name, and it gets it gets back to me that uh, my friend Conan, uh, Mexican live legend, I tell him the old Conan man, I need to change my game because I need to go, I need to make some money, get some sponsors, and they don't like the name homicide because it represent murder. I don't know what should I do. He was like, "Fuck that, keep that name." That name is you. I'm like, word? Like, yeah, keep that name. Not Captain. And I'm still homicide. Well, you know, I mean, you've accomplished so much in your career. A Hall of Famer, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I mean, and, you know, your buddy Phil inducted you, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that must have felt pretty damn good to be recognized just on that level, you know, that you're going into this you know, to this place where, you know, a lot of indie guys don't get the recognition, you know, like Dennis was saying early on, you know, and how does that feel just to be, it's almost like, you know, it's like the punk rock of wrestling, you know what I'm saying? Or the hardcore uh, rap, you know what I mean? So that must have been quite quite the feeling, quite the uh, the experience to have, to know that you're going to be etched in those, in that hall, so to speak. Yeah, man. I mean, that, like I said, that's one of my greatest moments too. Um, if you look at the tape, uh, I blacked out. Like, I had a speech in my head. I had sponsors, and I just blacked out. And I didn't even know what to say. For the first time, I got the microphone, and I wanted to say a lot of things, like a lot of thank yous. And, man, it was one of those moments, like, I don't want to drop F-bombs. And I say, fuck, I'm sorry that I cursed. And I was just straight. It was just me. It was just D. It was a homicide. It was no character. I choked up, you know. I couldn't believe that I was part of this. But to me, that's that's real. I don't give a damn what anybody say. To me, that's real. There's there's one that's called the Cowflower Hall of Fame. That to me, that's real. But this first ever independent Hall of Fame, man, to me, that's real. I don't care what anybody say. And yeah, man, I got choked up, man. You see the video? I blacked out and I turned my back in the beginning. I was banging on the on the stool. I like man, I can't believe it's happening, man. And I had so many fucking friends there, man. Like CM Punk came through, Chris Dixon came through. Like it was so many great guys, man. And those watch me be part of that. And the next day, I wrestled Moxley for the world title in GCW at the Hammerstein right. Ballroom. I'm like, man. It was so cool, man. And I never thought about this. Like one day, nah, man, I never did. It just one of those, like, I had so much weight in my shoulder. I was so stressed out that I wanted to be signed. And then for some reason, I couldn't get signed. So I went to Seattle and something told me, you're not going to get signed. Just appreciate what you got. Okay. And everything is in me right now because I'm not thinking about nothing. All I'm thinking is my paper and people I'm working with, you know, and, and 
and it works. It, it really works, man. It's so good. But I'm at right now. I can't complain. I just wish this happened 20 years ago, but that's <laughs> a story. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about how the CM Punk thing came to happen where he inducted you into the Hall of Fame? Well, it was really Chris Dickinson, but he was there. He inducted, uh, and I'm mistaken, um, not Jerryland, I'm sorry. Man, I forgot who he inducted, but he was there. We, we had a lot, a, lot of, a lot of talks. I even shot him out. I told him, go fuck yourself, CM Punk. And you can hear him say, what the hell I did? Because, you know, that's... I kind of do bully him sometimes in the past, but that's my dude, man. Like, I, I love St. Paul because when he left to go to WWE, he still called me. You know, he's a millionaire. And to me, in my head, I'm like, look at these guys that go to the WWE make a million dollars. They forgot the people like myself, everybody, the blue collars, you know, are wrestling. But this guy, he still called me and he's still himself. Everybody say, yo, he's an asshole. Well, to me, he's a, he's, he's a cool asshole. I like him. So I don't know. Well, he is, he is he is, he is an asshole. But we is. just love him. But we he's, love him. He's a, he's a cool asshole. It's one of those, <laughs> you got to have somebody in your crew to be an asshole. Like, Dude, you're an asshole, but you're back cool. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the state of wrestling uh, as we see it now, is it exciting still for you? Is it is it something that still kind of gives you kind of like that, you know, that drive? I think it's um it's a different era, different time. Um I would not say it sucked because back in the days my my era it sucked, you know. Um, but I do feel that it's not enough that magic feeling. And when I'm talking about that magic feeling, do you remember when um Perfect example was Scott Hall. He came to the arena and he told those you know, you want war? We're gonna have war. And he brought Kevin Nash. And when Hogan came in, to me that's magic feeling. Like Jake the Snake one day, he went to Dosi W and attacked Sting in the chair. And I'm saying to myself, what the hell Jake the Snake doing Dosi W? And he came in the ring and did the T Sting. Like I miss those magic feelings of wrestling. We don't got we don't got enough of magic feelings. We got the cheap pops, you know, like like Tony Storm, one of the greatest talent in the, in the industry. She came by, oh yeah, it's Tony Storm. All right, that was it. That's it. We we want that magic feeling. But we could talk about this for a month, for a year, or now, you know, like. The set of wrestling right now, to me, I'm not saying I'm not a big fan, but it could be way better. It's too many wrestlers, that's one, too much. You know, and some some of them, they don't know what they're doing. They need good trainers. They need good people on this side. They don't got good people on this side at all. You know, I would tell my guys, well, dude, you want to make money or you want to stay home and play PlayStation all day, you know, like... And I, they say, I want to make money. They listen to me then. They, yeah, I sold that for 20. I do that. Who cares? Everybody got a bad side. But the one thing about pro wrestling, I'm very passionate about this. I know what I'm doing. And I know what I'm saying, you know. So the new set of wrestling to me is like, we need that that magic feeling of pro wrestling. We don't, we don't got enough. And we need better people you know we have yes we have bad people back in the days but we definitely need better people right now it's too many too many egos i tell people be confident like myself i'm confident i'm a bad motherfucker bro i know i am because i'm very confident you know and i think everyone should be confident of their talent but sometimes some people they go over their heads well now I, I have to ask you this: We, your opinion on wrestling now? I know you're not high high on it. What now that you're in a position to change things? How do you change it? Realistic. I, I love being real. You know, like I might get in trouble for saying this, but like I say, fuck it. You know, I'm being real. You know, like my idol is Terry Funk. Why? Because he's so believable. My teacher mm. is Manny Fernandez, the Ranger Bull, because he's so believable. All the, the West Texas guys, the Bruiser Brody, those guys are very believable. When I go out there, I want the fans to be like, everybody, everybody say this is fake. 
whatever. You know, I hate that word, but let's keep real. Everybody say this is fake. I want to go out there and I want the fans to be like, man, this is fake or this is real. Man, this is real. The way he stab him with that fog, uh-uh, that's real. The way he punch him, that's real. Everything he does, that's real. I like that ballistic stuff, you know? When I close on you, we hear that smack. I don't want to hear no leg slapping. I want to hear that pop on your arm. We you get that person a clothesline. No, I want that ballistic stuff. I don't want that circus, that whatever you want to call it, you know, be for fans can see, ah, uh, this is fake. Watch, watch, watch this, watch this. Look, look at what happened next. Ah, I told you so. I don't like that. I told my crew, you're going to lay on, not being stiff, stiff. Like, they got to go home and take care of their families, so, you know, get that paper. But you're going to be tough. You're going to be out there and you're going to work, you know, and you need to be believable. And like I said, man, my yo, I'm five six. I took my character for Joe Pesci for Goodfellas. I took his character, put it on mine. I'm five six, but I guarantee you, we go to a bar. Don't mess with that little guy right there. But he will stab you in your eyeballs, and I would do it. You know, because I'm stupid like that. But that's part <laughs> of my. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me ask you a question, you know, getting into this producer role, is there guys in that company, like, for instance, maybe like a Carrie Morton or some of the younger talent that you're you like itching to get your hands on, get into their matches, get into the psychology? Because, you know, you've always been a psychological wrestler. Like, I've always seen that in your matches. You know, I, you might have been a brawler. You might have been that. But there was always a reason. So is there anybody that you're itching to get your fingers on? Uh, one is Jax Dane. And the reason why I saw a footage of Nikita Koloff and NWA doing a clothesline. And Nikita got a good body, no hair, same thing with Jax. He's finishing a clothesline. And I'm saying you last history right there. But that boy, I can make that boy to a star. Kerry Woods, he's another one. Um, To me, the best baby face in the rest of the business is Ricky Steamboat. And I feel that Kerry Wood is one of them. And he got a bright future, you know. No, now I'm a fan of the Rock Roll Express, but that's not a story. But Kerry Wood is one of them, man. He, he is phenomenal. Um, there's a lot of guy named Black G's, Church of Mother Black G's. Uh, he he's very underrated. People need to check him out. Um, man, there's so many people there. The girls, um, we got the hex, the talent of the hex. Um, they're like to me, Tully Blanchard, Arn Ar Anderson of the women's division, Ruthless, Grace Sakaji, uh, Genocide. Watch out for her, man. I'll be joking around. That's my little sister. Watch out for her, man. But she's good, man. She's really good. So you gotta watch out for her, too. Um, but there's so many people in that promotion that I like to work on, but definitely Jack Dane, Carrie Wood, um. Let's see, Black G's. Um, we got some new guy, Mims. He's a new guy. Um, I like to start with guys that got no name value. They're like rookies and turn them to stars. And they're going to have a bright future after that. That's what I like. I'm going to steal this question from Lars Fredrickson. Uh, you have a very, uh, a style that is all your own. And it's not very conducive to the NWA with their style, but yet you've made it fit. How many, how much tweaking or retrofitting different moves in there did it take you to kind of uh, become comfortable with the way they do things in the NWA in the ring? Well, I can say, like, my teacher, Manny Fernandez, what I do is, uh, I want to say I take his style, but I, I kind of study his style, also with Terry Fogg. What I like to do is that Texas style back in the days, bring it to New York City, put in a blender, and boom, you know. And lately, I want to make people, you know. So what I do is I sell a lot. I make them stars, you know. That's what I do. It's almost like you don't work me, but I'm telling you right now, you, you need to bring your A game, you know. If you don't, I'm going to crush you. No, and that's what I do. 
anybody, even veterans, it could be the biggest guy, the little guys, I'm going to break the A game. And my style, like, I never thought about, like, what is your style, man? I, I don't know, man. <laughs> it's just one of those, like, I'm a little guy that kick ass and never give up. It's almost like Rocky Balboa. The only difference is his fiction and I'm a fat. No, like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a quitter. I got so many people that put me down. They think I'm never going to make it. So I'm going to put them wrong. So with my style, like, I don't even know what's the name of my style. I just don't give up. Just keep going forward. You know, over your career, you've developed this character. It's pretty much like you said, a lot like yourself, right? But it's just probably maybe on 10 or whatever it is. And maybe it's not at times. I mean, guys like Eddie Kingston, you know, you can tell that's their real personality. It's just maybe magnified a little bit. That's where I think you two have in common. I could be mistaken, but, you know, just after talking to you, that's kind of what I'm getting. Has there ever been anybody that you've gotten in the ring with? What you're, I'm not saying that, because I know that how confident you are, but maybe you were just like, oh shit, I'm in, some, I'm, I'm, I'm in for it tonight. Like it's going to be, you know, one of those matches. Oh, oh. Manua Suzuki. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> that was the only one, the only one of my 20th career. I wrestled guys like Samoa Joe when he was like, no, I want to sell rookie, but damn, this dude was dangerous. I think it's more dangerous back then than now. And we, <laughs> we've been through like wars. And um, yeah, Manua Suzuki is the only person because I was saying to myself, like, man, this guy's going to beat the shit out of me. <laughs> But, and the best part is, a lot of people say, yo, that dude's old. Don't sleep with old people. Don't sleep. <laughs> and that guy, you do not sleep at all, bro. Like, I am so happy to be bonded and be good friends, you know. So it was kind of cool. So, but yeah, Suzuki was the only person that was like, man, this guy, ooh, you know, very timidity. I was saying to myself, well, screw it, you know, like, if he tries something stupid, I'm going to try my best to punch him in the face, have a little black guy. I'll be like, hey, how about something? You know, even though he <laughs> broke my arm or something, but at least I got something back, you know, but, <laughs> man, he, that guy, he's amazing, man. That guy is so amazing, man. Like, there's three, four guys in Japan who's my heroes. There's Masahiro Chono, that can, he cannot work. He got neck issues. Masawa. Oh, yeah. He's at the pearly gates right now. Kobashi, I teamed over him, and that was a blessing. And Suzuki, I lost her with Liger. Do you thought the Liger? I wrestled him, and man, he that guy's phenomenal. But yeah, man, I would say Suzuki is the only person that I was like, man, it's on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for my last question, as we wrap it up here. I have to ask you, what is left for you to want to do in wrestling? It feels like you've kind of done it all. Is there anything that you want to do before your bump card gets filled? Um, man, it, like I was saying, like um, earlier, like I went to Seattle. I saw I saw a sign, and I'm not, man. I always, I want a closure, of course. Everybody needs a closure of their career. I want a closure, but I don't know how that is going to close the story. Um, people that always want to wrestle, I got nobody except Cody Rhodes. I don't know why, but it's something about him. He got a good swagger. Plus, I love that Terry Falk and Dustin Rhodes back in the days. It remind me of myself and Steve Carino and Ring of Honor. But Cody Rhodes is part of my bucket list. And um, I just I just want um a great closure and and become a great agent producer the NWA. I will be selfish and be like, man, like I would love to to compete for the NWA World Title. You know, if, if it happens, happen. But do it, don't, man. So, <laughs> but. I really don't get a, a, a bucket list to be honest with you, man. Like, it just one of those, like, I just move forward. If it happens, it happens, you know, and I want a good closure, you know. I definitely would say that uh, my students, I got people like low-key, uh, 
this guy the monster mac i'm gonna work with them the last time eddie kingston was one of my best friends too i'm gonna work around one more time it could be tag team because we got unfinished business when it comes to tag team with me eddie kingston and i think all the rest of don't want us because we like the dully boys of ecw you know we like that <laughs> that wow um but yeah man like i I just, I just want to still work, you know. I still want to be here, you know. What I mean, like, I still want to be a producer behind the scenes and, and create my own vision. Well, as this ne next chapter is kind of opening for you, and I know that you said you got a bucket list, but is there a sense of of com a completion with you with the in ring work, or if it's, is it like one of those things? Well, I'm still going to do these indies for a while or whatever, and then get out of it if I can get a bucket list, like you're talking about Cody Rhodes, maybe I'll come out for that. I mean, is that kind of where you're at? I'm just trying to be, make sure I'm understanding you. Yeah, I mean, kind of, yeah. Because one thing I always say to myself, I love to do last things. Like, I want to go to the Kingdom for the last time. I want to go to the, uh, Japan for the last time. I always want to go to New Zealand. You no, know, they're gonna buy. They're gonna have a wrestling show in December. I always want to work at New Zealand. I'm I'm into cultures, countries. You know, I'm I don't know something about cultures. I'm into that. But last times I love that. You know, I broke my nose in Hawaii, of all places. I love to go back to Hawaii to get get my receipt. You know, but. Like I said, there's a couple of things that I want to do for the last time, man. Let's see what happens afterwards, man. I can't play things out. Like I say, with Cody, is something out of nowhere. It's something about him. It's like, hey, screw it. If it happens, happens. If it does, it does it, you know? But I like to move forward and let's see what happens. Let's see what takes me. Is it the most homicide thing I've ever seen, Lars, with the inflatable... Uh, what is that unicorn right behind you over your shoulder? Oh, yeah. Other, yeah other shoulder. I, I got kids, man. You know what that means? I don't give a fuck no more. <laughs> you, know, you know, what the most homicide thing was is wearing the NWA hat, the gangster rap band, but also working for the NWA. So it's kind of like this, you know, kind of pseudo promotion. So I, I clocked it. That's that's yeah. tight. that's when I think homicide. That's what I'm thinking. He's got he yeah he works for the NWA, but he listens to NWA. I you agree. know what I mean? Salute. <laughs> <laughs> How, homicide. Where can people find you, bud? Um, I'm very bad with social network. I'm very bad, but I got an Instagram side outlaw fifty one fifty like homicide side C I D E outlaw fifty one fifty. I got a Facebook, but I'm not into Facebook. You know, I, I think I'm the only guy who got no Twitter in this planet. I don't know, <laughs> you know, but I'm not big on social network. You no, know, Instagram, I'm, I'm kind of big there. Uh, I got hacked, so I did my page all over again. And oh, I like shit. to promote my stuff and also any company, the National Wrestling Alliance and all that. But yes, I, I love it to 150. Um, you can check me everywhere, independent shows, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, listen, for everybody at home, the show is over. Go home. We're going to say our goodbyes off the air. Lars, you're going on tour soon, bud. Uh, well, I'm going to the UK in August, but I got, you know, there's some few things that are going to happen in between. Yeah, th I mean, this will be out before that one pay-per-view coming up that – you know, you had teased on the last podcast, so we're excited. I don't know. Well, kayfabe, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, wrestling perspective, make sure you download it. You find it more than important than anything. You tell a friend. Homicide, thank you so much for this chat with us, bud. Oh, thank you. Thank you, man. Like like, like I always say, it's a humble appreciate for both. Lars, good luck in the UK. Don't take too much of those puds, you know. <laughs> you know, and man, thank you. Thanks so much for having me, man. Right on, homicide. It was an absolute pleasure, bro. Nice to e meet you. Yes, that's what yeah. they call it. Yes. Right